And this is the interaction that happens because for them to put in those millions and millions of lots into the market, they need to actually find the contracts so that there is an interaction between buyers and sellers. So the actual range is where they are building their orders. They are getting the liquidity to have the orders to buy. That is the actual intent of what is going on. So when you have different points of the schematic, that is actually how price has to move for those orders to be fulfilled and for uh, buyers to get in at a low point because obviously buyers want to come in at the cheapest price point. So those STs or those drives to the low are simply price dipping lower to get a cheaper price point for buyers and to, um, to get rid of supply. That's what they're trying to do. So that is ST, oops. That is the purpose of your STs, secondary tests. Then you have eventually your spring. Okay, what is your spring? This, this is worth writing down because the spring is the most important thing in a schematic for us, for the way we trade. The spring is, like I mentioned earlier, like an FU candle. It has the same uh, manners, not mannerisms, reasonings and wisdom behind it. The spring is serving the same purpose as an FU candle, which is taking out liquidity over here. So people who are buying over here, they take out the stop losses. That is the purpose of the spring. What else is it doing? Remember, this is an interaction between buyers and sellers. So what are they trying to do? They are trying to induce sellers on a break, retest, continuation. They are inducing sellers to come into the market. So when the spring happens, those stop losses are taken out. So exactly like the FU candle. Why do they want to take out sellers in the market? Because those are the opposing force. So they are trying to uh, falsely induce sellers into the market. Uh, with that break retest scenario and then take them out. So that is the purpose of the accumulation, isn't it? You're trying to take out sellers from the market and um, introduce buyers. They want to turn supply into demand. Actually, that's something that you should write down. An accumulation is simply a mechanism to turn supply into demand. That's actually what it is. And the interaction that is happening inside the schematic is actually a necessity for those multiple institutions to put in those millions of lots that they want to have, uh, which is an interaction between buyers and sellers. And they want to get rid of supply. They want to build in their orders, ladder in their entries. And the last thing that, what, that they want to do is to take out weak-handed buyers, which I mentioned earlier. What are, the, what are those weak handed buyers? As I mentioned earlier, they are going to be entering here, for example, because they see that double bottom, they see those as, as a support level, and therefore they are looking at that as a sensible buy opportunity. But what is the difference between the composite operator, CO, uh, which is the, the parties involved in accumulation? I don't know if that's a word, but the parties involved in accumulating, the accumulators, those are the composite operators. Those are the people who are directing the market right now. They are the ones putting in the big money and they are the ones trying to control the market, the composite operators versus versus weak-handed buyers. So both of these people are buying, right? Both of these people are trying to buy. The only difference is they have different intents. So the, accumulate, the people who are accu accumulating, the composite operators, their intent is to have a change in direction of the market, turning sell into buys, turning supply into demand, turning that bearish market into a bullish market. That is what the composite operator is trying to do. What is the weak-handed buyer trying to do? The weak-handed buyer is simply thinking, okay, we have a double bottom over here. Uh, we're at the end of a trend. Maybe we're in a demand zone. They're looking for a small buy, maybe only up until here. They don't know. But they're not looking for a huge change in character or a change in trend or turning supply into demand. They have different intents. So when, when uh, say, for example, if there was no spring, if there was no spring and price just went up and those weak-handed buyers came into the market, what would happen? 
they would take profit over here because they don't have the same longevity in their in their trade plan. They were just looking for a small move. Now, what did what do they want to do? Those buyers are now wanting to become sellers. Those contracts that they own, they now want to offload them, and now they become sellers. Now, what does that mean for the composite operator? The composite operator who is, you know, doing the whole accumulation, they are also buying up to here. But now, what do they encounter? They encounter more selling. So now that becomes more money that they need to put into the market to remove them and buy their contracts. So that, what is that? That is a form of resistance. The whole idea of the composite operator in the form, in the schematic is to have low resistance. That is the whole idea of a schematic. So if we are in, if we are encountering resistance that is over here from sellers because they were weak handed buyers, that becomes a problem. So what does the, in terms of the spring, okay. The intents of the spring is those buyers that were coming in over here, looking to have a small short-term buy, they are now taken out. Their stop losses are now taken out. So now we have uh, removed sellers from the market by um, all of these different parts of the uh, schematic where we have the interaction between buyers and sellers and those buy orders are being picked up, accumulating buy orders. And then sellers are trapped into the market by thinking we're having a break retest situation. So sellers are induced into the market and taken out. And lastly, weak handed buyers, their stop losses are taken out when you have that spring or FU candle, if you want to call it. So now who is left in the market? Sellers are taken out of the market because of the whole accumulation range and because of the FU candle, the break retest people, they're taken out. So now sellers are removed from the market and weak handed buyers are also removed from the market because of the spring. So the only people left in the market are the composite operators, the people who were involved in the accumulation. That is the only parties left in the market. Therefore, you have your test of your IFC or spring. Then you have banker block mitigation. That is also known as your LPS, last point of supply. And then you come to the AR, the top of your range. You're going to have a small uh, consolidation, basically, which is your Another LPS, sign of strength. That's what you want. The sign of strength is essentially saying, we have reached the uh, top of the range of my accumulation. If it is a successful accumulation, we should have no resistance because weak-handed buyers are gone and sellers are gone. So only people left are the composite operators. So when it breaks out of that range, when we break out of that range, we could anticipate low resistance bullish movement, meaning imbalances. That's what we want to see and strong bullish candles that would be the sign of a successful accumulation and what has happened supply has turned into demand and in the schematic we have had selling lower lows and low highs converting into high highs and high lows we've had that rounding off in the market and that is what a successful accumulation should look like before i show you some examples does that all make sense <clears throat> the, equilibrium, the equilibrium of the range doesn't matter too much. Um, it's just something that is defined in theory. Yep, correct, Cameron. We can advise don't have the same intent. Would you immediately stack orders on the break on the banker block? So the LPS is another entry opportunity. We have entered upon that, um, but you have to think: is it worth it? The ideal entry is the uh, test. That's your ideal entry. And if you're break even or if you're risk free, then you can also take an entry on the LPS if it gives um, enough confluences. If it's just a banker block and that's it, I probably won't enter. I'd like some lower sign through confirmations. Uh, after the accumulation, you can enter, but you have to really have justification. Realizing that if you're entering after an accumulation, you were, you're already late to the party. So you're not going to have the same risk reward. It's, it's just less favorable. You want to be entering 
on the test phase. Good stuff, motive intent means. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the test phase isn't, isn't really going to remove weak-handed buyers because it's not a play on liquidity. Like it's not, it's not purging through stop losses. So it's not going to remove anybody. It's simply a mitigation. No, the, the, when you have STs and then the spring happens, that doesn't take out the stop losses of the composite operator because the composite operator doesn't have their stop losses there. They, they, have, they have a wide range for their stop loss because they are trying to have a whole range of accumulation. They're not simply doing a 10, 20 pip stop loss. My UJ trade was LPS. Um, I believe it was on the test. The GJ trade Wiley just went through was the LPS, yeah. But my UJ trade was uh, was on the test, but it was a lower time frame confirmation, which is what gave it to me in the end. How do you differentiate between ST with wicks and the spring? Um, you have to follow the logic. But again, you're you're not entering on the STs and you're not really entering on the spring. I've entered on the spring on many occasions, but that is because there's other reasons to. If it's just a spring, you don't enter upon it because that is not um, a safe bet. There's no logic to it because we don't know where that spring is going to. Can you stack entries on the sign of strength? I actually took a loss, Musa, on uh, CAD JPY on Friday. Um, so I've, I've, I'll, I'll run through that loss because um, it's, it's a nice teaching point. But it's exactly that. You can stack on the SOS, but and it, I've done it before and it works, but um, it's not the best place to enter. You want to be entering on the test. I've already entered on CAD JPY on the spring and on the test. So I was just looking for that third entry on the, on the LPS around the SOS. But that one failed, so that one didn't work out for me. But I've already got my other two entries from the spring, so that's all good. Is a sign of strength of reaccumulation exactly uh, the sign of strength on the higher time frame is just a sign of strength, so a little consolidation. If you jump down to a lower time frame, I know this is chaotic, but what we if we are just looking at this segment, what we are seeing is higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high bullish market. We might have a one minute accumulation here. Break of structure, reaccumulation on the lower time frame, continuation. That's what's happening on the lower time frame. You zoom out on the higher time frame, you just see spring, test, LPS, sign of strength. But the lower time frame, yes, that was correct. Good question. Would you first TP in an accumulation schematic always be at the No, I wouldn't take profit at the AR because you're not trading the range. You're trading the whole market cycle that's coming after that. So at at least minimum, I'd wait for the break of range. Uh, I'd break even before that, but I wouldn't take partials there. Why you didn't put a sell at the test in GJ? Um, good question. It was widely traded, so I wasn't monitoring it. Um, likelihood it was either not enough confirmation, it didn't come to the point of interest, um, or whatever. We'll run through that example. Uh, question. To be honest, the reason why I didn't take the sell there is because I just didn't see it. Um, okay, fair enough. When I open up GJ to analyze it, that's how much data that has already played out already. Mm, I didn't mean they get stopped. I mean, they build up their orders throughout the entire collimation range and not just drop 100% of the buy running. Yeah, they don't, they don't drop 100% of their orders at the spring. They are, because to have this change in character in the first place from a strong bearish market, strong bearish market, shallow retracement, strong bearish market, deep retracement, that deep, that deep retracement was the composite operator putting in orders. So they're not just dumping in their orders in the spring. They're actually doing it in the whole preceding components as well. I'm going to actually have to remove a lot because this is getting way too messy. Can the sign strength be in this reaccumulation? Yes. Um, therefore, taking uh, another entry. Yes, that's exactly what I did on my CAD JPY trade. I saw the spring happening, and on the one minute time frame, I saw a reaccumulation, so I entered that. I'll show you because I think it's in this PDF. Um, 
Okay, it's not it's not in this PDF, but this is the example. This is CJ, CAD JPY. I just don't have the higher time frame thing with me, but this is all happening on the one minute time frame inside the spring. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, for Justin who asked, sometimes you happen a double spring. How do you recognize this? Um, you don't have a double double spring. What you have is a selling test, which you probably mistakenly thought it was a spring. The spring is just a few candle. Ah, one last thing I forgot to mention, which is quite important. Uh, we are looking for all of this to happen. Uh, this is not a rule from Wickoff theory or anything. It's just a rule we made is we will not take an accumulation schematic unless it's in a demand zone. So if we start to accumulate here, I'm not interested. If we start to accumulate here, I'm interested. That is that is the discipline you need to add into it because you might miss opportunities because of that rule, but now you are uh, more likely to get it because logically speaking, where is the composite operator going to accumulate? The composite operator is going to accumulate in a demand zone because that's where is your price reversal zone. Uh, price reversal zone. Your price reversal zone is a demand zone. So that's where you are likely to see an accumulation. That's how you can um, know the difference between is that just going to be forming lower lows or is that selling climax, selling test spring? How do you know the difference? Well, you don't know the difference entirely, but you can minimize your risk because you know it's in a demand zone. So you're likely to see something spring test. That's more likely to happen here. How early do you set limit orders? Is it straight after the spring? Uh, it would be more like this. Equal highs, then I'll see IFC or something. We have an imbalance from here to here. I'd set my limits once I've seen that retracement starting to happen. Then I'll say, okay, where is my zone of interest? Uh, do I see imbalance which shows intent? And then my limit would be here, my stop loss would be there. We'll cover its application on the next section. Remember I said that uh, this is just for the logic and then we'll, we'll do its application with real trades later on. How do you determine supply and demand zones? Look for where price are reversed. And a true supply and demand zone usually leads to a breaking structure. The different types of schematics we'll cover in the probably late after the follow-up sessions because they are not that common and they are way harder to trade. They are less prob no, sorry, less profitable to trade. And I don't want to add in confusion right now. Um, I think the main thing that everyone should be focusing on in trading is type one. Type two is rarer and it's harder to trade. Even, even for myself, I don't trade them that often. How long do you leave limits in? Uh, until it hits or until it's invalidated. Uh, invalidation. On a schematic, it's hard to say, but in, in other scenarios, I'll show you examples of when it would be invalidated. When you say demand zone, are you referring to points of interest? Yep, a points of interest can be a demand zone, yep. Accumulations don't always happen at a demand zone, but for us to take them as trades, it has to happen in the demand zone. So it's not a definite, it's not a fact of the market, but for us to trade it to make it prof, uh, probable, the probable thing to do is wait for it to be in the demand zone. Okay. I'll leave questions there for now. Let's run through some examples. I have to apologize because we're miles behind schedule. Alex has his whole lot of time frame stuff too. And we might have to uh, cut it short today and go and finish off that next week because um, it's important. But yeah, what are we seeing here? Okay, so we're seeing our um, impulse shallow retracement because it's, a, it's in a trending market. We have our preliminary supply, very shallow retracement. Then we have our selling climax. So that's a strong impulse. And if you are looking at the volume profile, you should anticipate an injection of volume. Why is there an injection of volume? Because that's where buyers are coming into the market. So you're having interaction of all of the selling volume and all of the buying volume. So you should see a spike in volume at the selling climax. 
how do we know that's the selling climax in AR? Because now we got from a shallow retracement, which is not even 50%, to now 75% retracement, and then eventually 100% retracement equal highs. This is your sign of strength zone. Okay. ST, STB, irrelevant. We're not too focused with that. What we are more focused with is the spring. Um, now we either had equal highs being left here, which is one, one tick. Another tick is we took out minor, a minor break of structure. So now that is showing me, okay, we had a spring because we had some bullish uh, movement after that. It took out the liquidity over here. And ideally, we don't have the example, but ideally this spring, mitigation of a previous IFC. That is ideally what the spring should be doing. So there have been there have been times where I've caught an entry on a trade on a spring because I had a nice uh, point of interest where that spring came to. It wasn't just a random IFC, but it was actually something a bit more encouraging. Uh, I'll show you an example of that on EU because I have one to mind. Uh, that's how you can catch the spring. But in reality, you want to wait for the spring, wait for those equal highs, and then enter on the test over here. And then you have your bullish price action after that. That's one example. Another example, I don't remember what this one is. Similar thing though. Um, that's, um, th this is just another schematic again. We're not too concerned with the selling test. Selling climax just defines the range. AR just defines the range. Um, we're not too worried about that stuff either. All we're interested in is the spring. Spring took out this area of liquidity. So equal those, and then spring, minor break of structure. There was no equal highs in this example, but it came back to the refined IFC over here, which is your entry, stop us down here, and then bullish price action. So that's how you take that one. This example uh, looks like it's the gold monthly trade. Similar thing though, we have rounding off in the market. We have something going on here. Again, this one is because it's on a monthly time frame. It's not worth uh, analyzing on the monthly because you wouldn't take it on the monthly time frame. This trade, this is this is the EU trade we just covered. We have the equal highs with the with the Wally block stuff. Um, but yeah, we had this accumulation that played out. This is all equal lows. This spring is basically an FU candle. On a lower time frame, you could have refined that entry to something. And reason being, you can be confident in that is because after the spring, you had equal highs being left, referencing this area. So equal highs, minor break of structure over here. Test, mitigation, continuation. Um, I don't recognize what, what chart this is. This, uh, this is, is more of a... Oh God, this is my remember? Super, I remember. So this is a break of a structure in the H4 and this actual time frame is M30. So we're okay. accumulating in that uh, point of interest. In that. Are you going to cover that one in detail next week? Yeah, yeah, we'll cover that one in detail next week. Cool, we'll, we'll leave that one for a proper breakdown. Uh, okay, distribution is, is exactly the same as accumulation in terms of logic, in terms of purpose, in terms of cause and effect. Everything is identical, except for it's the other way around, it's flipped. So the points are exactly the same too. They just have different names. Um, so your, your preliminary supply, still your preliminary, uh, sorry, an accumulation is preliminary support in distribution is preliminary supply, which is this, same thing. Buying climax is the same as the selling climax. AR, automatic rally is the same, ST is the same. UT is the same as ST uh, slash STB. It's just a UTAD, sorry, upthrust. This is upthrust. So basically pushing up or, or is it the same as ST. It's just pushing um, to test supply and demand. Um, see if there's any, you know, if they can take out, if they can introduce sellers at a higher price point. It's just that interaction between buyers and sellers. UTAD is the same. So it's upthrust after distribution. That is the same as a spring, which is the same as a FU candle. Your test is here somewhere. And then just, uh, bearish order flow is what you want. This right here 
sign of weakness is the same as sign of strength on an accumulation. This is just a lower time frame. Lower time frame redistribution equals the sign of weakness. That should be at the bottom of the range, which is defined by the AR. Uh, usually I won't enter here. I'll, I'll just enter up here. That's ideal. Um, and yeah, there's just some examples of that. Exactly the same as before though. Um, it's just marking out the points, but what you really want to be looking for is liquidity, FU candle, IFC mitigation, simple stuff. Okay, this is an example. This is GN. I'll cover that in detail because that's a very nice trade. We can already see at the AR, at the base of the range, you have liquidity, you have equal lows, you have your drives your buying climax and your ut you have your utad which takes out some sort of liquidity how do we know it's a successful utad or uh, spring would be we had a deep retracement a strong reaction and it left equal lows which is encouraging for us and the test all we did was again this is actually proves the point about the ifc traditional ifc would be uh this candle it's the last bullish candle before the sell and the sell that's your first bearish candle that's your second bearish candle so therefore without that refinement your entry would be there and your stop loss would be up here our refined ifc entry is here stop loss is here and obviously i got my entry down to here so lower time frame analysis but even just on this time frame you can see what kind of a difference it has huge difference your stop loss is over halved um and then yeah this is the same thing so your test is a version of a banker block. So you can enter here, here, or here. These are just multiple LPSY, LPSY. They're all doing the same thing. Um, we're getting break of structure here, equal lows here. So it's showing us that there's intent. We have now a full break of structure. We have an IFC over here, which is another LPS, so potentially another opportunity to enter. This would be another LPS, right? Sorry, IFC. There's mitigation, so another lower time frame thing. Break of structure. IFC right there, mitigation. Uh, refined IFC, you know, it's a normal IFC. This kind of right here, mitigation. So you can see there is multiple opportunities to stack. Once you have a break of structure, you look for your IFC. Um, and then there was, this one is a mitigation as well of an IFC after a break of structure, but probably not worth taking because it is, uh, not even 50%. So it's not in a premium area. You want to be waiting for a deeper retracement for us to be taking that trade. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that. I wouldn't take this entry. I'll cover that one properly in detail. This one, actually, this is the, I think, four hour time frame. Four. This is also GN, but this is the one minute time frame. So I'll cover this properly next week. But you can see, as we entered our test, this test area now is here on the one minute time frame. You can see how fract the fractal nature of the market, how you could have confirmed where to enter in that test, how you could have refined it. So as you were entering your points of interest, you had schematic starting to play out. You had your UTAD, which tapped into your zone. So that if you had a limit, that would be your entry. But if you were waiting for confirmation, you could have um, entered upon here on this IFC. So you could have reduced your stop loss size, or it's pretty similar in this case, but that was the confirmation for us. And then you have a break, you have equal lows, which induces a target break of structure with further equal lows here. And then you have this area here, which becomes your point of interest now because you've got equal lows plus break of structure. This is your point of interest. And okay, it's not on the screenshot, but here was another entry based on a mitigation of this. I'll show you that. I'll show you guys that next week. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave reaccumulation redistribution for next time um, because it's a little bit trickier and we have more important things to do, which is Alex's part on the lower time frame stuff. Hey, well, gosh, should we do like a 10?